Hello, John. Thank you for coming back to the channel. This, I believe, is uh, episode 10 of this long series of how the world <laughs> turns. <laughs> Decimus. Decimus. <laughs> it's like uh, the gladiator, you know, he was, I'm Deci Decimus something. So the 10th. <laughs> Uh, so I, I, the gladiator. <laughs> I, I want to remind the audience in the description of this video and all the videos I do with John, there is a link to his website. So click the link and you'll be able to sign up for his periodical. You can also sign for a, uh, an individual reading. We'll go into a little bit more detail, detail later in this video about exactly what a reading is. Um, he has more than 50 books that, that he's written so please go to, to his website click the link that's in the description and sign up for his periodical so john again thank you for coming to the channel and uh part 10 of how the world part turns <laughs> well you know uh two weeks ago it was around the time that i had uh released uh probably something that i'm going to do each year where um I'll do a big release for the whole year of predictions. Uh, and that was like 52,000 words and about 18, um, 18 articles. And what that'll do now is that now that that's out, now I can um, do the shorter, more frequent bundles of articles. You know? And also what I'd probably do, anybody that joins up um, will uh, to subscribe. I'll just for free give them that because that's supposed to be something you go back to for the whole year because uh, there's the, so I thought, well, I'll have that. It'll be for each year. I can do that. There's one like, here's what the main directions of the year. And then that allows me to open up to a lot of other different things other than what's going on in the world and Israel and then Ukraine and all of that. Um, and then I'll do I'll open each one up with a kind of a fast pace, 800 word thing where I guess go bam, 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 bam on all those to just keep everybody up and, and, and apprised. So, so that's the, that's the new, that's my new year's plan for this year of 2024. I will probably do a, a, a slightly larger thing for the predictions for the election, uh, which will be, um, I probably would release that in October. So just to get that out of the way now um you know in, in a way um well there's some major things that happened uh there was kind of a scare the last few the last few days when i think the thing is happening now is that the war has gone into a new rhythm in ukraine it is um it is now since adifka fell um that is the linchpin to the entire ukrainian line in, in their eastern front and Ever since then, now, the Russians have been gaining three times more territory all along the line than they did before. So it's uh, the Russians are, uh, as I predicted, are getting stronger and stronger as Ukrainians are bleeding themselves out, um, hurling their now, as I predicted, the um, very interesting thing is that when Zeluzhny was com the popular commander, the Ukrainian forces was uh, graduated up to ambassador of London. Uh, so he was fired upwards. Um, he was replaced by General Sirsky, Alexander Sirsky. And unfortunately, Ale Alexandros in Greece means protector of men, but I would not call him that because uh, he uh, he's called uh, he's called the butcher um, of Bakhmut for and Ukrainian soldiers call him that because he he has this just one dimensional thing. If if he can't he just keep hurling more and more people and think that it's going to be a breakthrough. And he's actually responsible for a lot of the bleeding out of the Ukrainian army. But he, everything that he, uh, Zelensky, the, the comic who's the president, um, they both have exactly the same belief system that uh, unlike, I'm wondering when Sirsky was, a, when he was a cadet in, uh, in the Soviet Union, when Ukraine was part of the Soviet Union in 1986, actually in my articles, I have a shot of him in the red, uh, red square parade. He's this young new cadet marching, you know, past uh, the uh, Lenin mausoleum and, uh, and who would have thought that, that a Russian born Moscow born man would end up when Ukraine split from Russia in 91 would end up staying in Ukraine and then end up being the commander in chief of the Ukrainian army 
Uh, I mean, it's hard enough uh, for the neo-Nazis that are running the Ukrainian government to deal with a guy who's um, Russian. <laughs> but uh, uh, he, he uh, and I predicted that he would, when Adyevka fell, he would just throw all kinds of, uh, of his strategic reserves into it. I heard it first was nine brigades. Uh, it ended up being 11. And uh, so, so in an odd way, he is actually hastening the end of this war by exhausting the Ukrainian army by being not a very good commander. And, uh, but he defends every inch of land. And that's, uh, that's the same thing that back with the other NAZIs uh, back in Germany and, and with the little fellow who looks so much like Charlie Chaplin <laughs> running them um, with his little mustache. Uh, and his uh, straight arming here and there. Um, he It's called the Roman salute, by the way. <laughs> That's how the Romans used to salute each other. Uh, unfortunately, it's like the good luck charm of ancient uh, groups that became his famous symbol. Uh, that's kind of a crooked cross uh, that used to be all, all ancient peoples had that magic symbol. It's a symbol of good luck. And if I ever were to write uh, my planned book about the that certain fellow uh would because he was also very notoriously good at predicting the future and i know this because there was uh, trevor roper and other other people uh when i embarked to do this i i realized that um he had this ability to um, make a lot of prophecies one of his last prophecy is quite stunning he just just a few days before he um did himself in in the bunker um, he he had a nervous breakdown when he realized the war was lost and kind of the last 10 days he just gave up and he, and uh, he said so he's take to uh foreman or his his secretary who recorded this he said well the war is lost and and germany is defeated and now the world will our void will be filled by the two new superpowers the soviet union and the united states and he said, they, they will now be in a big com competition to dominate the world. And uh, although it, they could go into a world war, I, I think they, are, they will compete more economically and politically than through warfare. Very interesting. But he uh, said, uh, but in either case, they will rely heavily on the German people as the cutting edge of this struggle. And that's basically what he said. And and uh, he defined the Cold War, or what I would call Cold War I, which ended in 1989, officially, by the way. By It's funny how most of the reporters don't. They take it to 92. No, it, it ended in, in uh, according to President George Herbert Walker Bush and the Soviet Premier uh, Mikhail Gorbachev. They met on a boat uh, in the Mediterranean, big, big ship. And on that, in that uh, meeting on the seas, they declared in December 1989 that the Cold War was over. And so it's officially, but nobody respects that, even though the American president and the other guy did it. But anyway, I, so I say it ended in 1989. Um, uh, I would just say that I call it the first Cold War because uh, then again, what happened, the whole thing has caused this Ukrainian crisis, this proxy war between NATO using Ukraine to fight the Russian Federation, is um, is because of uh, the Maidan coup that um, a uh, she likes to be called Toria Newland, not Victoria Newland, but Toria Newland, um, who has been pretty much the architect it's kind of hatched out that uh, but she was back there in 2014. She was the person who was caught on on phones, arranging with the Ukrainian ambassador. A before the coup happened, a new government, which was ended up being the who who the who's who, of of uh, NAZIs in Ukraine, and um, and they're not neo; they're old school, uh, the Banderites and and so much, and so. Um, so basically, the U.S. State Department had had actually created a new government, which changed the rules, which created the situation of tension because they just stepped in and took over. It wasn't democratic. Uh, Ukraine has not been democratic since 2014. 
Um, and, and so a lot of the people in Ukraine who were Russians said, wait a minute, we, we didn't vote for these guys. We have to have a new election. And they said, no, no, we're the new, you know, the U S just made that into the new government. And then it was, and from that, they changed the rules on a lot of things. And when the first president was elected after that, it was all rigged. Uh, and, and so, and that was Poroshenko, the chocolate king. He was an oligarch, you know. And and so the oligarchs took over Ukraine. Uh, the very thing that uh, the Russian president uh, achieved over a very difficult struggle uh, to get the oligarchs out of politics in Russia uh, after the end of the Cold War. Well, anyway, uh, if you want to see what, what would have happened to Russia if he had not achieved this, look at Ukraine after 2014. And what then happened was there was a uh, Barack Obama and his administration then started to sanction uh, Russian farming goods as a punishment for taking Crimea and all that. Well, it wasn't taken. The Crimean people, when they saw their government and didn't like them, literally saying, we want to flush all you Russians out. And they were saying it to a, a, a province that had been uh, Russian for 300 years. Um, as the Donbass, uh, Donetsk and Lugansk are also uh, Russian. And none, and a lot of these were thrown into Ukraine. We've talked about it earlier that Ukraine's kind of a place where Lenin and Stalin threw in all these different people without their choosing, without any referendums, to all live together in a nation that none of them had united to create. And so the most aggressive part of that was the Western Ukrainians who then uh, decided that they, they should run the whole thing and run it very much like the, you know, the, the fellow with the funny mustache from the 1940s. And, and so um, the, so then, so what's happened now is uh, um, just, just like the old NAZIs, the new NAZIs are doing exactly the same uh, mistakes. They're, um, they're they're trying to hold on to every inch of territory and as frederick the great once said in the seven years war um that if you try to defend everything you will lose everything and so and he won that one against a three-front war the, the imperial russia the austrians and the holy roman empire and the french were all going at it at three sides and he was by trying to fight them all it was a three's a crowd and ironically he um he had a kind of a good luck of the good fortune of having unexpectedly the tsarina elizabeth of russia of the imperial russia suddenly had a heart attack and died and so the russians withdrew so when he had just the french and the um um, Austrians to deal with, being that he was a military genius, he took them out piecemeal and after seven years won the war. But it was really like a... Now, now um, it, what's an irony here is that there used to be a very famous painting of, of Frederick the Great uh, with his steely bug eyes looking out, you know, and his little wig hat, and he was back in the you know 1750s and 60s and stuff. And so he's looking out, and when everything was going down for um, for you know, our, our, our friend with the uh, funny mustache, uh, he, he would sit in the bunker and often be found just looking at the painting, kind of a Nixonian moment, like when Nixon was talking to the president's paintings, um, which I, I'm not against. I mean, it's psychodrama. You know, sometimes if you talk to a painting, you get answers you know, or you talk to a wall or you just, I mean, when I was a kid, I used to sit in the backyard in the middle of the night and just talk to the stars and the trees and the everything. And then I, and I got answers. So, um, so uh, even, even people like um, our, our NAZI guy of, uh, of straight arming was a, a guy that would do that kind of stuff. So, uh, he was thinking that he needed a miracle like what happened to Frederick, like one of the allied leaders would die. And he thought that he got it in, um, in April, early April, when Franklin Delano Roosevelt died from aneurysm. And he was thinking, well, this is it. Now, now they'll, now the Alliance will break up and we can win. <laughs> of course, it's way too late for that. Um, and, uh, 
and like and like NAZIs of the past, NAZIs in the future and our present tend to look for pie in the sky miracles to get save them from themselves, even though they don't see themselves as a problem. But they, I mean, I mean, uh, it's it's quite a thing. Um, so, what then is going to happen to raise this up a little bit is that. Um, we're in a period of time now between now through summer uh where um the 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 people to watch out for who could lose it are are not the russians uh they're they they know what they're doing they also know that they have no interest in taking europe uh, they've made it very clear about that if the europeans were listening my concern are the european leaders and I was a little surprised at the one who kind of started that meltdown last week. And it was almost like, oh, my God, here's the, just the thing that I is going to be popping up. Uh, Emmanuel Macron of Paris, of France, the president of France, um, suddenly out of the blue decides that, well, you all got to join with me. We got to march into Ukraine and um Oh, but we're not going to fight in Ukraine. We're just going to maybe guard the, the border of uh, of Ukraine with Belarus, or we're just going to put a, a checking group that keeps Odessa safe. Um, but we're not actually there to do anything. I mean, it's just this is how crazy it is. Well, if you're going to hold this or block that, and you've got guns, and the Russians are saying they, again and again, if you go in, you're not any of you going to go out alive. Uh, you know, you are combatants. You will be, we we have said to you, do not send NATO into Ukraine. This war is an existential fight for us, just like the Cuban Missile Crisis had been. And so he was saying, don't, uh, don't do that. And again, the thing is so dangerous, the Europeans just don't listen. He means it. Nyet is nyet in russian and the russians are russians don't bluff they tell you straight up what's going to going to go down and then they do it and the europeans kept going oh okay all right, all right. oh then they go in they go my god what happened <laughs> he really did hit me back um and the so macron makes these statements i'm thinking oh man is, is he really going to do this but fortunately he uh it it caused a riot in the leadership everybody no 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 we don't germans don't want to do it the only people that wanted to join him were the little mice that roar the three baltic states who who are are very itty bitty not even a million people in some of them and with an army that's probably the size of a regiment oh we'll join your coalition yes you know and like the um um the uh, Kali, the um, kind of rhymes with goddess Kali. Uh, <laughs> not, a, not, a, not a good name in a way. She's she's really a, a piece of uh, mental work. Um, she's openly often saying, oh, we can beat the Russians. We, you know, Estonia, little Estonia, uh, is going to get the big bear, you know. And it's just, it would be comical if it wasn't, if this person didn't really mean it. And so... Uh, now the problem is that the French military of all <laughs> were already sitting on Macron and saying, "Look, we don't, we can't do that." I mean, at best, maybe we could send twelve thousand, and the British don't really have an army anymore. Uh, they couldn't even fill a bo uh, soccer stadium with what's left. They have the uh, the apparently uh, a hundred of the jets don't work anymore all of the tanks are basically rusting I mean, they can only send 12 challengers because if they'd send any more they wouldn't have much of a tank group the french have already uh, lost all of their Caesar mobile artillery it's all been blown up long ago in this war and so anyway uh the uh so the good news is that he got sad on and then Putin made it very clear. He said he was talking about nukes. You know, he was saying, look, we don't, we will never shoot one. If it, if it's nuclear war, it's because you guys invade us. 
And then, you know, maybe we will use a few tactical nukes. We may, you know, we don't want to. That's not our policy, but and it never has been, even though you keep trying to project it upon us, like you're projecting your own desire to do it to us. And so, you know, we could very easily slip into a nuclear war if French troops openly go there. Now, what made, you won't hear this in the Western news, but what made Macron so angry and to kind of lose it and want to, get all Gallic pride and on it all too sweet, you know, uh, and charge with the bayonets and the cannon, the cannon fodder, you know, uh, is Russian cannon fodder, but um, is that he, um, there was actually quite a military presence of French foreign legion soldiers, whole units that had just kind of decided together to officially leave the French foreign legion but uh, they were all um, based in a large hotel in Kharkov, which is not too far from the Russian border. And um, when this, so what Russia has been doing to make its point behind the scenes is they have been missling and hunting out all the NATO assets that are kind of in there pretending to be mercenaries or pretending in civilian clothes or hiding deep down in bunkers, generals. And I mean, there's a lot of NATO presence, NATO people uh, calculating the missile firing and just the Ukrainians are pushing the buttons. And the Russians have tolerated it because fortunately they're not hotheads and they realize that this could, so incrementally they have been, so they hit the, they hit the, um, a few weeks ago, they hit the, all the um, the legionnaires, foreign legion in that hotel, killed hundreds of them with a few missiles, and um, and uh, that really upset the French president because uh, and then he then he uh, then just uh, yesterday or a day before there was a huge decapitation of, of uh, that could have killed at least sixty NATO officers. In Odessa, um, they they found there's a resistance growing because Odessa is a Russian city, um, like Kharkov, that's in Ukraine, not of its own choice. So, what I'm finding is there's a there's a resistance movement also opening up. So they the Russians are getting very good intelligence, and they found out that there was this big meeting with a lot of NATO officers coming to with all a lot of the top officers of the neo NAZI forces of Ukraine, their generals, their sub commanders all came together because they're kind of trying to plan an invasion on the mouth of the Dnieper River. Another kind of media opportunity to look like they're doing something, but really not going to win the war and get a whole lot of their people killed. Um, and so, um, and at that time, I think um, Zelensky was in Odessa with I think it was Ursula von der Leyen or it was some other person. Oh, it was it was it was either Tusk or I think it was Tusk. It was the Polish um, head of state, I believe. But anyway, big NATO person, and they were driving through the towards the place, and you could hear the boom boom as the missiles started taking it out around noon. It was Friday, I think. And so they immediately told those NATO leaders, you got to leave and get out of Odessa. And so they immediately left Ukraine because if they had, unfortunately, the Russian intelligence is good enough. They probably knew they were there and they didn't want them to be caught in, in, in what was about to happen as the meeting was forming. But basically it decapitated most of the Nazi leaders and, and it's huge. And so... Um, so what that means is that the, the proxy is losing. The proxy that's been trained for, for eight years to fight the civil war and then fight the Russians, the Ukrainian proxy is losing. And uh, it looks like we're on schedule for some big events to happen between April and May, where I think this might actually start unraveling the whole line. I've always said, and I say it again, when it unravels, it will be dramatic. It will be sudden. And... Uh, and they're getting closer and closer to, it's just like an avalanche with a few pebbles. Oh, there's some movement here. And you know, I wonder what's going on. And then suddenly it goes, woof. Well, that's, that's what's going to happen. And when that happens, that's when the world's really in danger, not from the Russians, but from NATO.
and and the president and the, because it's elections time and all and so people in the nato and united states leadership are panicking and also some of them are getting fired some that i'm really glad to hear are getting fired like toria newland who is the uh architect of the second cold war she's the one that helped it happen but she she was um not retired she was fired because she was doing crazy stuff in fact um this whole this whole other thing that's happened over the weekend just uh, during the russian elections to try to distract the russians in the world from the fact that vladimir putin was going to win a landslide it takes no nostradamus to predict and i've been watching the russian news and uh there are four parties by the way beyond our little two-party system they all were running there's even the communist party uh, even though it's just 20 percent now um and uh Putin won by 87%, which is quite, and by the way, I even was watching it, um, the 50,000 polling places across 11 time zones in Russia, all of them have videos watching the entire progress of how people count votes. It's all in paper, folks. No, none of this, um, none of these uh, magic computers that have no uh, paper trail. It's all the basic, you come in into the poll, they take three days to do it, everybody picks, puts it in the box, and goes home like we used to do. Uh, the Russians have, one, and there were 700 watchers they were from 100 countries. They had something like over 700 uh, people who were across the place, and some of them were interviewed. There's like a whole army of people from out, Africa, all other places, you're um, not in the West so much, although some of them are some of my sources. They were actually volunteers, some of the journalists to be there. And, uh, you know, Russia, it's amazing to watch a Russian election. It reminds me of the way we used to do elections when I was a boy. It's a while back. You know, I was born in 1955. So, I mean, I remember, I remember when, how it worked. And I've also watched how it's been destroyed. So it really, it really gets me when people say, oh, they're a uh, democracy. So I'll look in the mirror, Mr. and Mrs. America. Look what's going on around you. You're not a democracy anymore. You are becoming a fascist state. And uh, that's really sad because the first way that it comes is when you lose your fourth estate. There are three basic estates in the Constitution. There is the executive branch. There is the U.S. Congress with its two wings. The, the House is populist. It's supposed to be because it's representing by population. The Senate is a counterbalance and it does it, the work slower. Uh, it's not so easy to pass through them because every state has two are equally, whether they're Rhode Island or California, have only two senators. But so the pop, the population, the mob mind can say what it wants in, in the Congress, in the House of Representatives. The, but then it has to pass through a, a very good check and balance. So those are the first two estates. The third estate is the Supreme Court and the justice system who continue to make sure that the Constitution is uh, followed through precedent, not through other ways. It's... You know, for people who want a, a really efficient democracy, it's got another name, fascism. Uh, fascist states are very efficient because, it, the, the, you know, our our founding fathers and mothers, you know, um, Abigail Adams, <laughs> um, were, were people who understood that it has to be messy because democracy is messy. It's just like what elon musk is doing with x it's quite a wonderful thing it's the, of all the main major um um public accesses that have been overtaken by privatization like facebook like google like and so on and so forth and also x for a long time when it was twitter was really bad um well, he's opened it up. And yes, if you're just kind of open-ended looking at X, what's going on, you're going to run into all kinds of things that make you cringe, like people fighting and, I don't know, people falling down in stupid ways and 
and all that but i keep it wide open because that's how i after an hour or two of watching it i catch things and then i can go with it. but it's wide open and it's uh yeah I, let, let me just interject john so I, I i totally agree with you on this whole branch of government and there, it, the way i see it and i've, I've done a couple videos about this i've been playing um some videos and critiques on uh neil ferguson all right mm. and he's been doing some lectures about constitu constitutionalism and rule of law and the judicial branch and you know so i've been watching that kind of thing and i've been also watching some videos uh, uh some rabbis talking about current events mm -hmm. and what is interesting it seems like you know neil ferguson which is a, a scott guy you yeah, know yeah, I, used guy, to, you I know? used to read him some, he used to be a source yeah. of mine yeah 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 I, I think he's a great great historian he's like he 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 straddles that economic and historian um you know both genres so, so i think he's, he's mellow he's a, he was kind of i think he worked for oh, newsweek yeah and when he was with newsweek uh he was kind of uh i i often would go to him to kind of get the the crazy right-wing version of things mm -hmm. <laughs> well i mean you know he's you know you know he definitely you know he he, he with a, a british story. flair <laughs> yeah you know well scott yeah yeah Scottish, yeah. yeah yeah you know but but you know the, he 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 had uh, Scotland, a concern, by the way. you know, yeah, you know, but he had it, he had this, he had this kind of uh, conservative aura about him because he was uh, most of the stuff that he did, his early work is really economic related. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people made the, and I did too, I thought he was an economist at first. And then I realized he was a really historian that yeah. was focusing on economic dynamics that. Yeah. They moved it wasn't his strong forward. suit. He got when he got wrong on a lot of things on the economy. I had to kind of watch him with a ten foot pole. You know, well, I I did meet him at a couple conferences. Oh, so, well. through, through through INET. Um, but but um, so it was cool. But but I was critiquing some of his work about um, in a positive way about constitutionalism. So when you're bringing up these branches of government, how I see it, hmm. I see it more like a physicist in a way mm. where the branches of government have different branches of government have different frequencies mm. and the frequency and the magnitude of that, of that wave. All right. So there's this, you know, wavelength and a frequency, right? Mm. So the Senate, you know, they, you know, they're in office for six years unless something happens. Right. Mm. So they have a different frequency then let's say the Supreme Court, which is lifelong. Yeah. All right. Or the executive branch, the, the White House, where it's four years, or mm -hmm. the House of Representatives, which is two years, right? Yeah. So so you know, there you have these different frequencies, but also you were bringing up, well, you have two representatives from each state in the Senate, but then different number of representatives based on the population density from the mm -hmm. census in, yep. the, in the House of Representatives. So mm -hmm. the magnitude changes based on the number of representatives. So, so there's this combination of magnitude and, and frequency. And fast and pace how the, and slow pace. Yeah. Right, right, right. And, and with the fourth branch of government, that's at a much higher frequency. It's day to day, yeah. boom, 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 boom. And, you know, it's higher fire. You know, with these, but the with fourth these, is, is it, it expressed directly in the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution is the free press. So you have these don't have that anymore. Right. right so we right. don't have a democracy. That right. frequency has been broken. And it's like H2 right. without the O. Right. So if you have a working system, if you have a working system, you have these frequent, you have these different frequencies that do cross over at yep. certain times and creates a different dynamic within the well, system. Well, they make a friction too, which is good. You know, people right. have to wake up, you know, they go, oh, what do you mean? He's, he doesn't right. agree with me. Right. Well, yeah. right. Right. So now, now we go to the rabbi interpretation yeah. of what's going yeah. on. <laughs> and I don't remember the actual country or the time period that he was referencing but he was saying that there were periods of time where the logic of law was inversely relate it was the inverse of what we have today 
So it's like, instead, you know, if you, if you're wronged, let's say someone destroys your property. Mm -hmm. All right. But, you know, we have laws in place where you go and sue and try to get some sort of recuperation from the lost property. Right. Well, there were time periods where people would say, you have property. It's your fault that you had property that we could break. Therefore, we are going to have you pay the person that actually broke the property. (laughs) You know, know, it's like this upside down logic. Right. And I'm, I, I think that the rabbi's right that we're moving into kind of upside down world. Or yeah, rabbi's news, right. <laughs> you know, Newspeak in 1984, yeah. Yeah. and it's like everything's upside down. Well, what is woke? So, woke yeah. is this. You yeah. know, it's like, uh, you know, if a person says, and I often <laughs> playfully in my articles, I I try to help people understand how woke may. For, for one thing, woke, um, you can't, it, it's trying to say I woke up, but if you really understand <laughs> from my experience of being with uh, Osho and and India and living with a master, there's only awakening. It's a present. It's a. It's not a noun. It's a verb, and it's present tense. And if it's woke, it's as dead as the last moment. And you can kind of see it's like, well, I woke, so it's like. I woke. <laughs> it's like, well, okay, I don't know, I'm pretty dead right now, but you know, it's like, um, so, so you know, people suddenly start. I mean, this is where the the quote of Gurdjieff is really good. The George Ivanovich Gurdjieff, one of the greatest mystics of the twentieth century. He was a Greek Armenian citizen of the Russian Empire born in 1866 and I think he lived he died in 1949 living in Paris um with his uh classes he does the mist he does these great dance meditations and he's famous for his his uh books like life is only real then when I am or meetings with the remarkable men when he was searching with this group of truth seekers, Russian empire across the board, men and women who were going in these amazing adventures to try to find what was left of spiritual um, teachings and stuff as the modern world was overtaking it, even in Siberia and Russia and all of that. And actually, there's a really good movie, uh, Meetings with Remarkable Men, that uh, had Terrence Stamp in it, who played the 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 Russian prince who was kind of heading the group. And then Gurdjieff was young then. And so that's a very good movie. It was filmed in Afghanistan in 1979, just before everything unraveled. So it had some of that feeling of, because uh, he had been through all the stands, Gurdjieff and the Tibet and um, all over the place. And then he brought back this amazing um, teaching, which kind of, the harmonious development of man is where you get your three centers in harmony. That is, um, you know, you have most people are not in harmony with their three main centers, mind, heart, kinesthesia. And so your gut, you know, and so uh, your gut feeling, your intuition. So most people, that's why people have a hard time talking to each other, because I might be talking to you with my heart, but you might be thinking about what I'm saying rather than feeling what i'm saying and then the gut is out to lunch somewhere else or you're you're you got your gut going with your mind and you think you got a good idea but you're you're not hearing the emotional impact of the consequences that the person is saying in the communication so you know, the, the whole idea was to uh, bring attention to to your life uh moment to moment and it was odd because the moment i was initiated in 1980 from osho in india Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh, and he, uh, I became a disciple. I felt compelled the next morning to go to the five-star hotel next to the ashram and go to the bookstore, and I was pulled to buy Meetings with Remarkable Men. And I really didn't know why, but it just, I, I would follow my intuition as I do as a medium. And I realized, so I started reading Gurdjieff and all the time that I was reading him, because the reason is that Gurdjieff and Osho are, di- the way they express the same truth is diametrically opposite. Gurdjieff was about the work. 
that you and he wouldn't pick he wouldn't be open to a whole multitude of disciples his his way was to not waste time with people or just you know the one in a million that's going to get it so let the rest of the million go because he just doesn't have time he's going to work on a handful of people because it's a very important thing in consciousness that that um as i've uttered before in these shows uh that um consciousness is a quality that counterbalances the mob mind of the minions, the unconscious mobs. And so, uh, you know, I've been saying how, in especially now in this period of time, it's very ripe for this thing to happen, that we need another 200 people who are um, harmoniously developed, you know, where their, their mind, their heart, and their kinesthesia are, are all working as one. And then something beyond those becomes the alert witness of things now his way was to go through work to find like clench the fist to find the relaxation because your fist can only be clenched so long and it's more about working it out than uh it's not a goal what you it's like buddha also was working very hard like gurdjieff in when his uh attempt to uh he had been a hedonist for the first part of his life and then when he broke away from wife wife wine women and song and palaces and being a king or prince he just did the other he was a you know he was born under a full moon in uh, may so he was uh so he was a uh, had a scorpio moon you know death and regeneration versus taurian earthy pleasures you know property things to know things, nothing, naked, watching, no, no eating, everything. So he he was basically a fixed uh, sun sign. And he went uh, into in astrology, and that means he went from one extreme, hedonism, to another extreme, asceticism. I can never say that word, right? Um, aestheticism. Anyway, <laughs> I can't say it. Uh, it's where you beat up your body and and mortify your flesh to find God in that regard. And, and then he finally just after 96 years of that, he, he uh, almost drowned in a little brook. He was so weak because he was skin and bones. And, and he, he just said, crawled out of this little brook back to his Bodhi tree uh, to sit there. And he just mused, uh, if you, if you tie a sitar string too tight, it breaks if you have it too loose, it cannot play music. And he began just before his enlightenment to kind of figure out that the middle way is the way, neither this nor that. And now some masters go bring you to it through a, a lot of activity and only choose the few. Now, my master was a complete opposite. His was the path of let go, of just take it easy, let go, a more Taoist path, water course way. But the interesting thing is that you end up in the same place. The, the people who, I would contend, the people who work to get there kind of did what Buddha did. They, they kind of exhaust the seeking. And then you know, when Buddha that night gave up, he just gave up. He ate, he ate some food. He went to sleep after years of not sleeping properly. He, he woke up. He said, I, there's no eternity of the soul I, I, I just give it it just is i tried my hardest i say so let it go he let go hedonism and then he had to let go working at it and um, because as he would say in the 42 years that he taught after that everyone is buddha nature that is awakened not woke awakened buddha nature you are whether you know it or not this very body is the lotus paradise or this very world is the lotus paradise. This very body is the awakened one, the Buddha. It's it's not something you can achieve. It's something that you can only at last, in the right moment, understand. And sometimes you have to fight real hard to find it, to discover that that's you. You then get into your exhaustion, and it's not just an intellectual thought. There's some people go, oh well, you know, I'm. It's, they're just they're in their heads they're they're people who eat who want to eat pictures of rice cakes as the zen masters say and the problem with the rice cake that you eat that's on a piece of paper in a beautiful painting is it's not going to nourish you and so you can if you're just using your mind not your heart and your kinesthesia in harmony you're you can you can think oh well i I've, I've got the solution um i must already be a buddha and therefore i uh, need to stop working at it 
if it's intellectual, if it's the picture, not the reality, but a picture of it, you're as far off from it as even worse. And so many people, as Ramakrishna used to say, so many people uh, with thinking, with getting intellectual about the spiritual pursuit, with being enamored with occult mysteries and practices, he says many of them are on the on the roadside, on the path, the pathless path. And every anybody who spent many lives trying to chase after the Buddha will never will will be pre predisposed not to look in but to think the buddha is over the horizon or that somebody out there is going to give it to them and in, in odd in odd ways sometimes you do have to go somewhere unusual i had to go to india so it's not it's not a it's not a binary thing well oh it's wrong to seek osho sought immensely and he had kind of a similar thing to buddha he just at one point he just stopped he said, I, I, it's, I, it's not there. He had the same thing. And then he went to bed and then suddenly this vast thing happened to him that he had to run out of his room. It was on the 21st of March, 1953, when he was 21. And he had, his, he had to get out under the sky. Otherwise, it, he would be killed by having this immense energy inside this room and his, where he was sleeping. And so he went, I think it was in uh, Jabalpur at the time, and he went. He, which is a central location in India as a city, he went uh, out into a, a city park and he noticed that the Malshi tree, this beautiful kind of shady tree, uh, was glowing with a special aura and he sat under it. And then he said, as I, I can understand what he was saying, he said, suddenly everything descended. He was like seeing, he could see the light of the sap. He could see the life in the trees it, it was uh and then he, as he sat the whole thing settled and descended in some vast eternal in the present grace and i mean a similar thing happened to gurdjieff in the middle of nowhere somewhere in the stands you know somewhere in central asia um his issue was he was a very powerful hypnotist probably one of the most powerful in history i mean even mesmer couldn't be like him and and he, i i really Gurdjieff has this weird way of, if you read him, he's got such a strange delivery, and it's for effect. If you read like Beelzebub's Tales to his grandson, <laughs> which is one of his main books, you, you, you have to remain attentive. You have to read it and remain attentive. But it's like what often would happen is, after I finish a process, I would kind of, kind of collapse in my bed, and then it really would be happening. You know, it's like it exhausts the mind for me um and so to create a let go and so i mean osho did a lot of created a lot of meditation techniques which i um you know offer to anyone who does a reading with me uh they're usually about 90 minutes or more it depends i do at the end of my day so it can go as long as it needs to go uh or as short as it needs to go <laughs> and uh, so but uh, sometimes a lot of the people are interested in, in, and I talk about these techniques and how the the uh, Osho was trying to create a, a harmony between the let go and the and the effort, um, and his way would be these meditations that are one hour, with four parts usually, and where you have active parts uh, that get less active and less active and kind of kind of create a space for you to throw out all the uh, ambitions and all the dust of the day and and then when the final 15 minute part happens it's the part that most people start with in the, in the west the mindfulness people where they say oh just sit there and watch your breath people of the 21st century can't do that that's not at least how you start and because and uh, any of you who are listening who've done mindfulness and all of that um, you, I, if you're honest with yourself, most of you left it because you tried hard to be quiet. You tried, tried hard to be mindful and you succeeded. You're full of mind. Meditation is no mind fullness. It is to give it a name. It's the absence of mind, something that's deeper than the mind. The mind is something Look, uh, did you have a mind before you had a brain? I mean, when you were born, 
it's uh it's kind of a question that uh you know when if you really look back of all the things that you think define yourself as a person a persona um in your process of being conditioned and to being in life and living in a world of dialectics and and comparison and a linear life from here to there you forget the vertical that you were born with that is forever deepening and forever rising because so that's why it has that quality of verticality and and what happens is you um, you lose memory of the, the the Buddha. You come in as a child, the innocence of Buddhahood, but not knowing what it is. So it's easy to miss because it is so ordinary. It is the most ordinary thing in existence. And because it's so here now always, and so this very body, folks, this very place, you know, and they go, what? No, not New York City. No, that can't be it. Not, not Seattle, not this, not Bombay. It's all noisy and people are fighting. And it's dirty and smelly. And, but no, it's like, yeah, yeah, no, it's this. Um, and so the mind, it's so against the way we're programmed over many lives because you've got to do something. You've got to... Even Buddha, even people in India have got to do your yoga. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. And in a way, it has a function. Um, you know, this fight with the world of appearances, you're trying to use it to find something that's beyond the world of appearances. Um, if you do it totally, you might discover in the process that it's the ultimate disappointment. And uh, that's good because... Um, you cannot become something you already are. So then, then the work changes. Then it's more like, okay, you take up the hypothesis. All right, I don't feel like I'm a Buddha. I feel like an idiot. Um, in the true sense of the word, one who is un idios, one who is under the illusion of being separate from the whole existence. As an ego, as a person, persona means mask. That's a mask over your innocent Buddha that you were born as. And then what happens, this awakening, this innocent awakenedness, um, you, you, you have the people by the time that they've made your body, by making love and being your parents and all that, they have also, like your teachers, like your priests and politicians and pedagogues and parents, they've all lost the thread. They've lost the memory because education is not yet in this planet drawing out as the word means it's not drawing out your buddha it's draw putting in an ego and so and there's nothing right or wrong with the ego uh you need an ego you will be using this brain you will have a heart that you didn't have before you're born a kinesthesia you will have to eat you will have to interact with others in a transitory visiting of a world of separateness and change but what balances all of that out would be a, a more enlightened society would make sure that, yes, you learn the ways of the world, but you don't become the ways of the world. You were, you, because, and how do you do that? You, when you're that tender, innocent person, just come into the world of Buddha, they will help you remember that that's really the counterbalance to everything they're going to teach you. And, and, and that's, and then you find a balance between, so you use your ego. You can't drop an ego. You can't drop your mind. If you did, it'd be go splat on the floor and you wouldn't be able to do anything. <laughs> you know? So it, it is, but you can drop, you can understand identity. You can understand how you've been made to identify with things. Like, like if I'm getting into my car, I'm the driver of my car. Um, it doesn't function without me being aware and driving it. But if, so it's like, okay, you've come into this body as a child. They're going to talk about the driver of the child, the, the light, the lux eterna of the child. That, that, that is spontaneous intelligence. It will use the skills that you have and you'll learn not to get frightened and and there won't be people kind of forcing you to compete or be anguished or all that because 
in that kind of society, if your teachers have not lost their Buddha, they're not going to turn you into a neurotic person. They're going to help you at least not to become one, and you'll have a much better chance in this in this life, because everything is out oriented. Um, everything is find it over there, rather than the fact that you have the whole treasure already. Um, even as a hypothesis, is is a way to keep you. Um, always running around and around circles of samsara, life after death, after life after death. And, and you know, the, you then, it's like I was just reading again, like Osho was talking about reincarnation, and I've, I've sm spoken about it in other shows, but I actually read the whole passage again to refresh my mind of what he was saying. And um, I mean, basically, the real secret of reincarnation is that it, enlightenment never reincarnates. Um, mind reincarnates. Personality, you know, it gets under the illusion of an of an attachment, holding on to it in some very subtle way. Um, people then try because it's all they know is their ego. Each life they try, or what happens is they die and their ego is destroyed, and all the thoughts are thrown. It's like it's like radio waves. Um, it's like he was saying that Buddha understood. He said, when the witness gets caught in another wound. Uh, that's what Osho was saying. And when Buddha lived in 500 BC, he didn't have proof of he was trying to describe something that never that didn't exist in people's understanding so for long ago, and 25 centuries ago. It's like radio waves, light waves and radio waves. It's like he, they're all around us. All, in fact, it's one of the things that's making everybody a little crazy because there's too many people living unconsciously. So it's like too many radios are all yelling at once in the uh, psychosphere, um, the psychic sphere, I call it. Uh, I've changed the name, a new hogism. I call it the psychic sphere that we're turning into a psycho sphere, <laughs> a psychotic sphere. And, well, and, Pete, I don't know if you've if you've noticed that people are complaining that they're starting to get some physiological changes. Mm -hmm. um, either uh, heart rate is changing, or headaches, or <laughs> right, 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 right. You know, you know. The thing is, is that yeah. Well, we have to be careful with yeah, yeah. I won't raise this. I'll call you it know, Voldemort. going for it. Yeah, you know. So, but there is this there there is this concern that individuals are are actually having physiological effects with with certain types of frequencies oh, absolutely. around them that are new yeah. <laughs> let's yeah. just put it that way neo well, we'll call them neo frequencies <laughs> neo frequencies yeah. or frequencies uh -huh. that would happen in a microwave if you lived inside one or if you were too close to an atomic blast but now it's your your power meter you know, and and um, the there's it's interesting because there's three points of kind of what I, I call this back in 1985 and 1987, that is, or 88, was when we cleared five billion people. And my contacts in Native American and shamanistic groups and stuff made me aware of this thing that was creating a larger energy in the world. Uh, like 30% more energy for everybody around that time because we, on the good side of it is, because there's always a good and bad side, a positive and negative. The good side is that because there were so many people, we crossed the line at 5 billion people in 1988 that there was a positive to that, that it was somehow stirring the kundalini of the human collective. Um, but the downside is that that means you have to stop being a mob and be a quality of consciousness or enough people and it doesn't need a lot just maybe 200 more than than are uh, regularly enlightened but it need but it needs a little more to counterbalance this explosion of population which has exploded more thinking that's unconscious more hurling of thoughts and emotions is unconscious into that as as um Robert Monroe of the Astro Body OBE stuff used to do. Um, it's called, he used to pass through it, he called it the mind band, the end band. And he used to say, when I passed through it, it was like I was passing through 
uh, all the radio stations, all the AM radio stations, let's be worse than FM, all those radio stations all yelling and screaming, going da 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 at once. And and then he passed through it and it'd be over. But uh, so I was a, I used to work as part of his gateway, one of the 50,000 that he was working with back before I was with OSHA. It helped me immensely to make the step to OSHA um, because he would use these beautiful 32 track um, earphones with tapes in those days. You put the earphones on, you lay and you watch your breath and it would, it, these, he was a radio a music a mixer guy and he was a genius. And uh, he, he got these, what he did is created a theta state uh, in your brain uh, through this, this thing. And actually what you'll, it was helpful because you can actually do this very easily. Once you've gone through the process of these kind of met more active meditations that then get you to the place where you don't need headphones, you just are there. Um, it is very natural to be in the theta state. Again, it, it is a non-doing phenomenon that changes everything. It's, a, it's nothing, non-doing attracts mysteriously great activity in creation. I think it's the very nature, it's the very nature of existence. This is why we have this beautiful Leela, this play of universe and planets rising and falling, having nuclear wars and being born again and all this. It's, it is... It, there is a strange magnetic attraction of a point of consciousness that is not judging, not doing, not even being. It doesn't exist. It's free even of that. So it's also free of not existing either. It's something in between the this or that, the up or the down. And in a strange way, and the way to be in that is you don't, you don't, there's nothing to do. There's nothing to achieve. You're just there. And in the in a quality of that, they bring that into your active life, walking in Zen, sitting in Zen, doing doing things. I'm speaking from my own experience, is that you get you suddenly uh, things happen. You have not chose them, you have not, you're not, I'm going to do this, but you become a different magnetic pull to creativity. And I think is the no mind that is in the center of all the mind and movement and stuff and something beyond both is, is a fundamental reality of this. And everyone has their own way of finding it. The doors are as infinite as all of us, as infinite as all the unique leaves on all the trees in the universe. But the place we all go to is exactly the same place the no mind and i'll give it a name it doesn't have a name it's beyond names but it it can be hinted by the fragmentary words it can be hinted even by the pictures of rice cakes but just don't eat a rice cake that's just a picture you won't get anything out of it but a bad tummy <laughs> <laughs> so it's it, you know, and a lot of people have thought out in theory exactly what I'm saying, but they stop there. And that's the beginning, not the end. I know because I did it um, for a while. I was I had figured out everything. I did this thing where I was coming very close. This is before I went to India, uh, and it had kind of the fall of the magician. You know, it's which is if you survive it, it's a good thing because it's really it's a nervous not, not a nervous breakdown but a nervous breakthrough but it's very nervous <laughs> i i was getting very excited because i had these 10 main things that i was theorizing it was very philosophical and i was i had written them all down when i had finally written the last one i was sitting at the table and i suddenly felt the world was frozen and i felt that i was deader than dead can be even a dead body couldn't be that dead and empty and forlorn. And I fell off my chair. And since it was the late 70s and we had long shag carpets, I always heard that people, when they go crazy, chew carpet. I said, well, I'm going to chew carpet. So I she goes chewing the carpet and crying. I was alone, so nobody came. <laughs> be freaked out. So I was lucky. I didn't get put in a straitjacket at all. But I just for 30 minutes just chewed the carpet. 
and and uh and then and then i calmed down and then i realized uh, i've gone as far as i can on my own i did my best i need help but not a psychiatrist who will just keep me in the in, try to make me normally mad like what's like that's all psychiatry can do it cannot bring you enlightenment but i mean the ideas of psychiatry actually in india are very ancient and the west had just kind of come around to the ideas but it's a, a part in the way it's not the beginning and the ending of it so i mean uh, a lot of people in my movement and including myself did a lot of great therapy groups and bounce off the walls and therapy and and um and uh, it also, I noticed that a lot of my, my community became addicted to therapy. They were stuck in the picture that you can, if you see all this shit that you have inside, you gotta, gotta keep working on your stuff. First off, with a little deeper understanding, when more relaxed perception, wider, why do I call it mine? Why is this stuff? That I call stuff mine. When did I, when in the in the process of being a child who didn't have any judgments about stuff or my stuff or your stuff, they were just going, you know, <laughs> everything's fine or crying or something, but real, authentic. If you then start look watching yourself and you start thinking, um, almost everything that I think I am is something that somebody told me I was. I, my empty page, my tabula rasa, as yours and everyone else's, came into the world empty. And rather than build something around that of the world and it's making its mark, but not on the tabula rasa, let this tabula rasa develop in its own time, its emptiness, its fullness of emptiness, uh, its skyness, so that clouds can play in it rather than turn it into a, a sky that thinks it's only made of clouds. And it yearns for the beautiful wispy clouds and the white puffy clouds and the beautiful sunrise and sunset clouds. It's afraid of the hurricane clouds and the typhoon clouds and the lightning storms. But in all this uh, cloud, 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 cloud stuff, it's forgotten that in everything that emerges in the sky disappears into the sky and the sky is never touched by any of it. There is, so that is not taught as a guidance, a hypothesis for each child to follow. And because of that, the things that were given to be used, we are also taught to identify with them. For instance, I was in my car a few moments, a few minutes ago. You know, I'm aware as a soul driver that the car is not me. But if you go through the process of conditioning, you cannot escape it, that you will come to some idea that's not your own, but you think it's your own. It, that and you'll fight people and die for it, even though it's you know this flag or that flag. You'll go to war and but you or for this Jesus or for that Buddha or for that Islam, and you will go and kill each other in thousands of wars. And none of this was yours when you were born in all of your lives, none of it in all of your future lives, too. None of it. You are not these things. They, they were supposed to be things that you use in a dialectic visit to this temporarily to this planet. Uh, it's, it's atmosphere. You got to learn how to breathe it, but you don't think you're, you're the atmosphere. You're not the planet. You're not the earth. You are somebody going through this. And, but you're trained to think of yourself as an identity an idiot, and you will become an idiot. All the whole human race is a bunch of walking, talking idiots. Gurdjieff used to use that analogy all the time in a very respectful way. He would say, you idiots, his Gurdjieff disciples, okay, you idiots are going to dig a hole and you idiots are going to cook the dinner tonight. And, and But they knew if you really think of yourself as an idiot in the right way, and that is, I am, the hypothesis is everything I'm doing I'm under the illusion of being separate from the whole cosmos. So then you start to become aware of how you've started to own feelings that if people push that button, you are either happy, 
robotically, or if they push this button over here, you feel your guts have been opened by somebody's terrible statement about you. How could you say this about me? You hurt my feelings. But there'll come a moment if you start living more and more intensely because you're watching and seeking, because you will be more alive. You will feel things more. You'll be more alive, so you'll hurt more because you're no longer trying to hide the, yourself from the hurts or the happinesses and how they're fading as well as the hurt will also fade because they're transitory. Then the question goes deeper. What is watching this stuff pass by? What is watching this body grow old? What is watching everything changing? It's always there and it never changes. What is it? Who is in? Or as uh, Raman Maharishi, one of the great sages of India, and died in 1950, he started 18 years old to ask, but not as a, not as a question, but as a, a presence. Soon he dropped the, the question. It's the most profound question. It's the only question that is really needed to be answered because in it, all everything is answered. Who am I? Who is walking? Who is talking on Paul's show? Who is watching me talking on Paul's show? Who am I? Who is eating? Who is crying? Who is loving? Who is hating? Who is walking, watching a mountain turn ivory in the higher angled sun of the early spring? This is in my area of the world, Pacific Northwest. And all the mountain snows are now looking ivory. Like somebody has poured ivory coat of ivory over them, a bit of a yellowish, beautiful richness. And then I remember who can see beauty? I go in. Well, Maharishi, Raman Maharishi, um, he, at 18, he became, he, 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 he negated all the things that he, that the society, oh, you're this, you're a man, you're a woman, you're a, you're an American, you're a, this makes you happy, this makes you sad. And then eventually what happens is you come to a point where there's, it, it's like what Buddha used to say, you, you're peeling the onion layer by layer of any problem. You're just doing nothing but watching it, watching it unfold before you as you watch your breath, it, relaxing east, deeper and deeper with each. And then you allow it to, the layers of the onion of a feeling hurt by someone who you expected to love you would not say that. You just watch the layers and the layers are memories. The most recent memory, the person stinging you so horribly and feeling so hurt and judged. Okay, those, just let them be there. And then they fall away on their own accord. And then you've got deeper layers and deeper. And if you just stay with it, you'll go back to the moment when you owned it, ego requires property. And the kind of property that ego owns is ideas, thoughts, judgments. And, and then the, um, the, um, the mortgage is identity. You're taught to hold on to things, good and bad, rather than just move through them as a consciousness. I am not my car. But if society trains you the way they want to in their own unconscious motivations, between the age seven to 14, either at seven or at puberty, you're going to suddenly find big changes happen where you forgot the soul driver. You put him over there and you've been taught that you are the car and no one's driving it. You are the driver. The car drives itself. And that a car without a driver thinking it's driving itself, well, just turn on the ignition, get out of your car, let it start rolling and see what happens. 
it's history, baby. It's history. <laughs> this, is, this is the the main theme of history. It's like great empires. You know, they they go, they're like a bunch of cars that were just let loose. And they'll go, sometimes they're lucky and they conquer this and that. And other times they run into the Goths who are coming over the border like people are coming over our borders in exactly the same way. And the empire falls. The car crashes. The collective traffic jam crashes. Collective traffic jams of people pretending not to be pretending to be cars are how we start our wars, our crusades, our witch hunts. You know, where this is you know, our sorrow when our when our baseball team or football team loses, all the cars crash. Boo hoo, we lost. That's more not so dangerous. <laughs> but if you think you're Ukrainian. And if you think you uh, you are the pure uber Ukrainian and the other Ukrainians need to be taken out of your country, then you go into wars. If you think you're, a, you're NATO and you think you're a defensive organization, you even say it, it's in your, it's in your charter. But if you're encroaching across Europe when you promise not to, to the Russian people, who as a body of people seem to have a more collective connection to the soul than a lot of us. It's an interesting thing. Don't believe me. Don't believe or disbelieve anything I'm saying. If you believe it, you're lost to it. You're, you've stopped. So even if you say, yep, John Hogue's got it all together, you stopped. And it's equal to, oh, he's crazy. He's a madman. It's, you stop. I don't believe him. I do believe him. Belief is the worst thing that has happened to the human race as a conditioning. Because what is belief? It is a, if you meditate on it, well, how do you believe? You just watch the process. How do you become identified as an American or a Jew or as a Christian or something? It's you somehow in the, in the kind of the need as a child to be loved by all these big giants you've discovered yourself born amongst. You're going to, you're going to start, you know, they reward you if you behave in certain ways they even tell you look you got to grow up in the world growing up means you have to be like us so you know do what we do and uh, not how not what we say <laughs> you know don't do uh do as we say not what we do and um and then you learn how to be a liar you learn how to be a manipulator you have to because it can save your life as a child you know if you're not uh, our survival mechanisms uh, have their part in the world. Actually, just like war has its part in our world, just like peace, you know, two sides of the same coin. Now there comes a point when your survival mechanism screws up your life after you've it's worked to keep you from not being thrown out in the streets when you were a kid because you compromise all your intelligence to be, you know, to, oh, I'll go to church. I don't know what that is. It doesn't feel right. But, oh, I, or you'll say innocent things that get you thrown in the bedroom without dinner. You know, innocent intelligence. Go to your room. Uh, those are the moments when a Buddha is suppressed. Go to your room. And so you, you know, children are smart enough that they, they want to survive. So they try to, they think it's, they, they're told it's called love if you submit and fear God like you fear your father and mother. And, 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 and then you uh, end up, and, and it's not their fault. It's, this is the, one of the biggest cosmic jokes about it. You line up all the criminals of history and all the people who are either murdered by them or followed them. You, you can't be responsible. No one in this world has ever been responsible for all its crimes and mayhem because you have to be conscious to be responsible. I mean, it's like it, when they say, oh, well, he was he was drunk or he was unconscious. He or he went crazy and he and so we'll help him and we won't punish him because he wasn't himself. Well, none of us are ourselves. None of us. We're somebody else's idea of ourselves. And then it's put in collective ways, like ourselves are all collectively the um, American or 
we are all Zionists and we, we, this is our land, these people, because we're exceptional, because we're higher than everybody else. I mean, like those guys in Germany, we're higher. And the guy with a funny mustache, oh, but we'll take some of his habits, but we won't look at the, look in the mirror that the man with the funny mustache is showing us Zionists right now. Um, and what we're doing to the Palestinians and, and, and was done to us. <laughs> now we're doing it to them. Um, you know, this is the funny way identity plays us, plays us, not, uh, we're not playing with it. It plays us. And, and you can't, you can only, st the way out of it is to rediscover that, that thing that you have lost, that Buddha that was born in the baby's body into a world that if it could remember what it was like, they would certainly not do the harm they do in the name of drawing out education is actually a coding over of an ego of an identity identity is from the same root as idiot so you you are made an idiot and your life is idiotic your world is idiotic it's doing all kinds of idiotic things in your name and so these things you know, it takes guts. It takes guts to be a truth seeker, a spiritual seeker. It takes guts. You'll never find, you will never find a coward who treads this path, but you'll never find a courageous person who has not confronted their coward first, because it's the same energy. You will never find someone who truly loves until you understand how much you hate. And all the dichotomies are that way. I mean, we've said before on the show that, you know, Deva in Sanskrit and devil, divine is Deva, devils, Satan, are the same energy. One is gross, one is coal, trying to become a diamond. You, so they, they have a, a dance to play in this play of existence, cosmos. And... But so if people can come back to the source and live in the present with that source, it definitely changes your life, makes it more. You may still get afraid. Something in you will feel fear. Something of you will feel romantic love or whatever. But, but you will feel there's something deeper that will move through those things totally, but not of them. It's, it, it, is a, it is beginning to become clear to me after a long search that there's nothing to do to solve it but understand what was lost. can never be lost. It can just be distracted by being out, out, out. And you then live in the outward world as a Buddha in the marketplace, totally more lusty with life and living it and vivid, but not of it. Things actually become more close to you when you let them go, if they're true. You know, and so, and the stuff that isn't true, it falls away and it's good. It clears the situation. The dust on your mirror that witnesses everything in your life this is like a metaphor for consciousness. Most of our mirrors are covered with dust from our conditioning. And so we see the world through a Christian dust or a Muslim dust or a Democrat dust or a Republican dust. It's red dust or blue dust. But you got to first start seeing the dust on, and you first start to get reacquainted and refriendly with your eternal mirror witnessing consciousness. That cleans the mirror, and then the picture changes. Now, most people live in a cage with the gate open, and they would rather, and most people won't take this journey. Only the courageous, frightened, courageous people. <laughs> will take this journey because because what has happened most people there have become camels there's these three steps i've talked before it's in nietzsche's uh, thus spoke zarathustra 
my teacher, my teacher Osho talked about this, the three stages of consciousness. You're born a child, but you, most people become camels. They're beasts of burden, burdened by the conditioning of ego. They've completely bought into it, believe it, are scared to question it because they, they're so afraid of the unknown that they'd rather live in a prison that they're familiar with and is a kind of surrendered to, given themselves up to, like a certain path of life, living in a certain way. Uh, it, it, and they're terrified of actually stepping into the unknown beyond what they know. And they're, therefore, more, most people live kind of a, a, a manageable misery. Um, and, uh, and so that's the camel. But you will always know the, um, the spiritual survivalist in you is when the first thing that happens is a rebellion, a questioning, to, uh, uh, suddenly saying, I'm tired of being a camel. I, I suddenly realize I don't like the way I am and I'm tired of this stupid uh, prison. And I'm starting to understand something that there's never been a lock in the door. I always thought I was locked. Now that I see this prison more clearly, I, I, I always thought that I was locked in here by fate, by destiny, whatever, all these things I can't control. But now that I'm starting to see things a little more clear about what mess I'm in, there's no, there's the keyhole has no lock in it. And the door's open. It's always been open. I'm the one keeping myself in here. And then you find, well, why? Why am I keeping myself in here? Because I know what this prison is. Maybe it's worse. Maybe it'll be more terrible out there. But you, you reach a point is you realize that whatever it is, where I am now, I am rebelling against it. I do not want to be in this prison as its prisoner of identity. So you take a jump out the door. And that is the beginning of the, the walk towards the lion. The camel becomes the lion, the roaring lion. No, I'm not going to do that. No, you've told me this. Why should you tell me what Jesus meant and what he was right saying about us when for one thing for sure, Mr. Guy with the pointy hat and the slippers and the funny dress, you have never known Jesus any more than I have. It's, it's, it's 2,000 years ago, and yet you, you talk as if you know. you. In fact, the worst thing is the people of authority who almost know what they're talking about. They're the ones that are very good at programming people to be camels. But the lion starts to recognize the camels in his life, and he rebels against them. Rebellion is considered evil in a world of egos, but rebellion is a is the catalyst for Buddha, for Jesus, for Moses, for all the great teachers. They were all rebels. They all questioned. If Jesus had not questioned the Sanhedrin, um, what would have made him walk into the wilderness for 40 days and nights and be tempted Frankly, my favorite version of Jesus being tempted by the devil was Donald Pleasance playing the devil in, Jesus, in that Jesus Christ series in the 70s. <laughs> you know, uh, he was a great, great actor. He was this little kind of mousy looking guy. In The Great Escape, he was the fellow who got blinded and he couldn't see anymore because he, and so um, he was, they were escaping and his friend was going to walk him through it and their plane crashed and he couldn't see that the Germans were lining up to shoot him. He couldn't see them. So he, he turned around. It's very tragic, but he's such a great actor. But anyway, should um, D give you a little break, <laughs> a little, a little straying from the, from the narrative for a moment. But um, so, so then you you start to recognize how and there'll be a lot of anger at first you know and but there's there's meditations also that help you there's nothing wrong with being murderously angry uh, the problem is if you kill somebody that's not going to help you or the other 
But if you, one of the meditations that Osho used to teach was the anger meditation. And I used to do it. And it was because I'm an anger type. Um, you know, the anger types end up being compassionate. But, you know, I, it, it, anger, if you go into your anger, you will come out of it more compassionate and understanding about things because you know yourself. Know thyself. You know your how you tick, how you have been made to tick oddly, you know, and 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 so you you take a pillow, you put it before your knees, you know, as you're sitting there in a room alone, and for 20 minutes you do this. You you put the pillow, and if you're somebody you want to put their name on or something that you have want to direct your anger towards, you put the pillow there, and then you grab another pillow and you start beating it. Boom, boom, boom. Now now. Osho used to say, you know, first you'll feel really silly because you're not feeling angry. You're not. But he said, just keep going. Just act. He said, don't worry. It'll come. Just just be in the moment and keep beating, beating, beating. And there is, you feel like this is, I feel so stupid going, I'm not really feeling anything. And then suddenly, unguarded moment, your hara, your belly will get full of fire. And then you'll be going, ah! <laughs> the pillow. And you will be you will be take, taking all that anger into the pillow that you would have to kill people because it's there. The, 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 the art of it is you've got to find a way to be okay with it and not harm yourself or others. But, but so that's what's so wrong with this whole saintly thing where people, well, you know, don't be temper, don't, don't be angry, be civil. And so all these walking, talking volcanoes we become because there's just you can't let it all go and but there's be ways to do it because you should not dump this energy each on each other i mean the fact that everybody's all walking around repressing it is not repressing it in the psychosphere and it's creating the mind plague that is uh which i'm going to write about in an essay in, a, in my book the book of things to come which i'm starting this year it's it's a um i calling the essay the zombie prophecies because basically we we are i'm going to make the argument in my essay is that uh, why we're fascinated and also repelled by zombies is that we are zombies we came in as buddhas we are trained to forget all that and suppress that and we become zombies and to be kind of out of touch with oneself kind of in a stupor in the kind of in the drunken stupor of ego um we can then avoid we're taught to avoid those things we've actually taught to suppress these things you know to because if you flip out you know, they'll take you away in a, in a straitjacket but what if you had a society where or you're in your own private space you're not out in the street doing this where you can do things where you can open your channels now some people they just keep doing it and doing it and that's also a trap you know it's like then it's like oh, i'm working on my stuff well no the, the truth is you have no stuff that's what you, if you go deeper, you realize there is no stuff, but that's just a hypothesis now. It, it, don't, don't believe it or disbelieve it because belief is a qualified ignorance. Some guy, some stranger who is authority figure, who's, who's looks like he knows, almost knows what he's talking about. Um, you, and he's asking you to surrender, put, believe in this, put your faith. It's a test. And, and you do, and then you get in a in a community system where everybody, if anyone questions the belief, you're kind of moving out of the community and not supported psychically first, and then literally sometimes. And you know, you have become that black sheep. The word for the black sheep and its roots is heretic. That's where we get the word. Um, so, but I will I'll contend to you this. Every great teacher, man or woman, who has been a great Buddha or Christ begins as that lion, that sheep, if not a lion, a sheep that goes on its own, whatever comes. Because you, you will never see an army of Buddhas coming to save you. You will never see an army of Christs coming down to the Jordan River to be bathed and baptized. 
you'll see one dirty, weather-worn fellow coming out of the wilderness. You will see only, you may chance upon one Buddha under a Bodhi tree. He, this is not a collective phenomenon. This is the ultimate spiritual state of the, the individual, the undivide you all. The undivided, undivided. The society is constantly trying to make you schizophrenic, but only in a way that you will be a, a, a cog, a camel in the train of camels. Um, you know, there are some of the, some of the work goes too far, and the schizophrenics become um, certifiable. But everyone is turned into a schizophrenic in this world, and uh, some of us get tired of it. Some of us see it. Maybe some of us have been trying to break out of this for lives, and and so you know this this struggle is there. And then what then happens is. When the, when the channels are open, when, when the anger can be expressed and it can be then transmuted on its own accord, then the possibility is you come full circle. You come full circle to the way you began. You become again the child from the camel to the lion to the child. The child this time is not the same child. This child is not like the fish that's been told that there's an ocean and the fish has swum all around the sea to find this ocean to the point of exhaustion and never found it. This child is like a fish dropped back out of the ego world into the oceanic and you have a good laugh. You realize it's, it's always been all around me and inside and out of me. Uh, it's so normal and so here and now that it's easily missed. But if you start to get the knack to see it, to remember yourself in it, then everything begins to change. You're now a child who's come to the second childhood, the born again child. You know, the Christians have it, have also compromised that beautiful idea of Jesus. They've, they, they think, oh, okay. it's just like people getting woke. It's another way of saying I'm woke. Because, oh, I'm born again. I mean, it happened with my brother. My brother was quite a Jesus freak in the early 70s, and as a lot of people were. And, and he was trying his damnedest to uh, undam me. And he did it out of love. I mean, he's, he's mellowed since then. I mean, he's mellowed. Yeah, he had to go through that to become the Christian he is now, which is wonderful. But um, but there was a point where I my Uncle Ken uh, was was visiting from San Diego. And I loved my Uncle Ken, uh, my mother's brother. And he used to be a medic in World War II. And so I, I finally even tried, okay, let's see if I can get born again once the whole thing. And so I, he, and he was beautiful. He just told his story. He was, he was a Lutheran and all, but he just told his story. And he told the story of, he was a, a professional army, you know, before the draft and all that. So before the war, he was in the U.S. Army. And he was in the uh, divisions that went into Manila, the only really large city battle in World War II in the Pacific Theater. And it was horrible. In fact, it's, I was watching the World War II week by week, uh, which I have been since the beginning of it years ago. And it's a really good show. Show It times you through the whole war every week. And if you follow it for the six years, it, you really get a feeling for, for the, the tempo and how things happened and how things ended. And I think it was last week, it was the end of the Battle of Manila, where 16,000 Japanese Marines made a fight in downtown and uh, his... His army guys went in there, and he was he was mostly tending to the Filipino civilians. One hundred thousand of them were killed, hundreds of thousands injured and wounded, and he had a uh, existential crisis with it. He was thinking, uh, "The world is evil. It's just, it's just profoundly evil." And like he's a medic who's like dodging bullets, and so he kind of kind of a breakdown. And then his he had a friend who was another medic who was a Christian, and he was kind of bearing witness to him as my uncle Ken was bearing witness to me. And the beauty of it, through love of him, I became a born again Christian for only fifteen minutes. <laughs> 
<laughs> I was like, oh, I'm bright eyed and my eyes are like, oh, like my brother, everything's fine. And, and so anyway, so my brother and I were sleeping in the same bed because um, Uncle Ken and his family were over and also, you know, we had to, so I, I'm, I'm nestling up to my brother's back and I said, Jim, Jim, what is it? <laughs> I'm born again. I, I, <laughs> and he went, oh, great. <laughs> So here's the guys when like rrr, rrr, and he's like and it, it was such a jesus bug buzz kill <laughs> i was like wait a minute. and then i yeah i lost it i i think my brother accidentally did the best thing he could have ever done for me you know and then i realized i then started realizing something over the years that now i can bring voice to into although it's bigger than anything could be said you you can't be born again and be, and be born one time once in a, upon a time. I mean, you can't be awake when you're woke. You can't be a Christian woke again because it's fast. It's dead. It's the 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 divine only dwells outside of time in this moment. It is this is where it is. It's this little itty bitty moment where the whole thing is. Nowhere else, not in the future, not in the past. And when it starts to center in you, it changes all those subtle ways in which you, you live in time. And, and it changes ways in which you perceive others in yourself and, and how you create. You begin to see what immense mystery is consciousness and love. And you see that really all the things that frighten you and the, your body, your mind, you'll still have anxieties and stuff, but it's happening to somebody else. I mean, maybe there'll come a time when Osho, like, I, you know, he, he seems so luminous with it. I'm just in the beginning of it. But I mean, it's like the thing, if you say, I'm afraid of, if you say, I'm not afraid of death, I did this to somebody just recently what happened was interesting in this new state that i'm coming into is that i am afraid of death is true the i is always afraid of death but there's something watching in me who's saying i'm not afraid of death that is afraid but it's not the thing i was born with it's not the thing I brought into this world. It's not the thing that death will take away either. Although, as I say that, even now I can watch my mind going, oh, but how do you know? How do you know? But the mind becomes someone else's mind. It's yours, but this your possession is also something that you didn't come in the world with. So it's a very interesting process, and I try to... As, as much as being a medium to help people in readings and I it's always a thread underneath all of my talks about the world and you'll see it in the articles the my my forays into current events and the future are really an attempt to bring people to the present because that's the only place where the solutions are that's the only place where your enlightenment is purely creative by doing nothing at all it happens so you know, I, that's the thing that I bring into readings and into my writings. Um, so if you're interested in having a reading or writing, you know, just check out the beautiful way that Paul has laid out my links. I'm starting to get more people from this community uh, that Paul has created online that are starting to show up. So I'm starting to meet a lot of you and we're having wonderful interactions. Um, so... So that, that, that just so I can plug for the ones that are watching, make sure that you click the link. It's in the description of this video and all the videos that I've done with John, and that'll take you right to his website. And by doing that, you'll be able to sign up for his periodical and do the readings. Yeah. Those are, they're, they're all different choices. You can have three choices on how to do it. You can just do it at one time uh, just to see the, get uh, you know wet your feet in the one stream of 
articles that I've produced in that week or something. And then if you like more, you can join or you can be an automatic. You go through my pay, my own page uh, website. It takes you to the page where you can sign up and uh, you can be an automatic, which means maybe five, ten dollars a month. And then it's just on and on until you want to stop. Whenever you want to stop, you can just go in and unsubscribe. Uh, and then the other is where you just do the donation one drop in for 12 months. And it's about $60. And, and yeah, $60 or a little more. And you get a, a lot of material. And, uh, and you get all of my sources that... Um, I, I try not to say anything in the world, especially with the controversial nature of, of trying. I am part of the alternative media. A lot of us used to be in the mainstream media, but that media, as far as a fourth estate, is dead. But we are alive. And many of the people that you might have wondered, where did they go? You'll find them there like Chris Hedges, like, you know, people uh, that I well, wondered what happened. Did they die? Where are they? They're there. And we're all, you know, we're all trying to finance it on our own. There's no, because when the man's not pouring money on it, the man can't censor us and hide our sources. Because our job, as I see it, and you'll see, you'll see that people may, there'll be an opening to all kinds of very interesting people like Alexander Mercurius and Alex Cristofaro, the Duran, or Scott Ritter, um, or um, Chris Hedges, and um, John Mearsheimer, and other people. Um, and it's a, it's, I have all sides, because you can't look at politics and the world without having sources on all sides i mean you'll 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 meet one of my favorite people and most of these people they don't know me but i'm sending people to them but uh, you'll meet patrick lancaster who's i've been watching him for eight years report in donbass the civil war he's an american who went there when the referendums were starting he fell in love with a russian girl and and they live in, uh, have two children. They live in Donetsk and the city there, and which has been shelled by the Ukrainian army for eight years. Cluster bombs, cutting people down in the square. And I've seen it. So it's an interesting thing that meditation can do. You can be in that too and not come away from it, take, carrying it. But I, but this guy, he's, he's amazing. He's He's very boolean and he's this little guy and he used to be a sailor. And 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 he and whenever he, he's he looks like a frightened bunny rabbit when his eyes get really big, but he goes right, puts right in there, you know, right into the wolves. <laughs> and uh, and it's quite something. Um and you'll also see places in my work, my sources, where you'll get to see how the Russians really are. Not how you're told on the evening news or whenever you get your news. I'm dating myself. Um, uh, you won't have Walter Cronkite telling you things anymore. Anyway, so um, the you you will. I mean, some of some of my sources are vloggers, and like one of the best vloggers to kind of get an idea or a feel for Russians and people living in Russia. There's two of them. I, probably some of you already know it. Like Luna the Pantera. It's where there's Volva and Vikya, and they have this black panther and and this dog named Venya, and they live in Siberia, in Siberia. And I, I have to watch them every day. It's, they're just wonderful. And she she's like, she's like the reincarnation of Chekhov in this big, big-eyed Russian gal who's little gal who who she does running accounts i'm learning a lot of russian listening to her because there's subtitles but and and it's, it'll, she'll say something really funny like you'll see venya's eating snow in this vast track of snow where they live and, oh there's venya she's saying in in russian she's doing her little bit to bring the spring <laughs> just eating the snow you know it's like she's she's like Chekhov or something you know that's the other thing you find out even the garbage man knows his history and knows his literature they are very literate people 
Um, I mean, in the middle of when Patrick was in the fighting in Mariupol, he was in that a lot. And that was really something The one of the first big battles of this uh, in 2022, when the Azov battalion was terrorizing this Russian city that was um, in Ukraine and the and there's bullets flying and suddenly they ran in between all this bullets flying around and he stops where there's some cover and there's this guy walks up and he says and he's a retired general. <laughs> And he's like, yeah, well, you know, and then he's just, he he knows what's going on in the world, <laughs> like any you know, in the wood, you know, it's like, a lot of times it was like a variation on Dostoevsky characters, you know, they're, they're a bunch of characters, the Russians, very interesting people. And, and they do have, they have a quality of soul that um, is unique to them. And, um, and if Americans knew what I knew about them, we would be friends. Really, the Russians and Americans should be brothers and sisters. They're really that we're not is really perverse, because um, they're real people too, and um, and they have been. They are not out to play evil Putin, the guy who's you know Doctor Evil and all that. That is so infantile. You're not children, but your government and and your all the people that are trying to kind of shape you they they don't respect your adulthood. Um, and uh, and if they succeed, you will all die in a thermal nuclear war that your country created and Europe, not the Russians. They don't want to do that. They've seen what it's like to lose twenty seven million people. They saw it with uh, when the Western people under the Axis Alliance invaded Russia. And that, they killed all those people in three years. They still have the scars from it. So when they see the Europeans massing like Napoleon again, like our little fellow with the mustache, um, uh, in his NAZI alliance of half of Europe when he was going in 1941, if they do the Napoleon, they do the Hitler, I said it. <laughs> they do. They do. NATO, the 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 defense uh, alliance, which has already broke its charter twice when they bombed Serbia, that was absolutely illegal. They 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 should have, out of shame, broke up NATO because they they lied to themselves. That was a, a war of aggression. Libya is not even in Europe, in the North Atlantic region, and NATO went there, promised that they would control any side that was doing any attacks on civilians, but made a decision just to bomb the Libyans that were with Qaddafis, the Tripolitans, destroying the place. So they chose a side, and Libya is a destroyed nation. You know, it used to be in Vietnam, this evolution of the military industrial complex used to start with, well, we had to destroy that village to save it. Well, we've evolved our that maxim to, well, we had to destroy that country to save it. And if we don't break this habit of the war business, folks, before, the, before we're dying of radioactivity, those idiots will say, well... We destroyed the world to save it. So, but the good thing is people are waking up. The lines are being crossed even, even in a world where people are being dumbed down. What's going on in Gaza is awakening the world. And a whole lot of people, a whole majority of the Jewish people of this world are not siding with the Zionists in this. Uh, and any as many as all the Europeans, majority of Europeans, were not siding with the NAZIs, Europeans, in the last world war. So, so it's a so. And the other thing too is it, you're seeing signs of revolution in a good way. You, all the farmers are getting it that what the, whatever this globalist thing is about, it's about destroying in the name of global warming destroying a certain civilization so that they could supplant it with their own and i never thought that it was really i, I was skeptical of this for decades but it's it's true 
it, what it is is simply another bunch in this case uh klaus schwab is like another another without the mustache uh, he's um you know he's one of these people a, a german up in the alps you know just like Bertha scott and uh in his own little swiss chalet even though he's born in germany who has this idea in, in davos that uh, uh you know you will eat the bugs you will own nothing i mean nothing and you will be happy <laughs> well they're 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 cartoon characters but they're really serious about this and you know mr gates and all that and the things he's doing with pseudo food and all that it's uh the there's there is there are people that want to do a very tricky world war and use us as the dupes but if you if you start um relearning your rights that you have not been taught for two or three generations i, I my my high school uh and when i was in 1974 graduating from high school um the following year a uh, year or two after that my high school stopped civics classes and it started to roll all over the all over the country that was a way to dumb you all down and not you have a part in your democracy you don't just vote for people and forget otherwise you get on either side republican or democrat you get the the governments you deserve because you're you've been trained not to um do your part you know this is lincoln said this is uh you know this, this is of the people, by the people, for the people. I might have gotten the sequence wrong, but it's like, it's you people, not your government. It's not by the government, for the government. And so you have to re go read your constitutional rights, become, memorize them. Um, and, you know, and there's a few people out there that are uh, that are very good. Dennis Kucinich is a constitutional champion uh, who, who might be a congressman again uh, come around this new time. He found a way to find a district to be a congressman when they they could only take him out by erasing his district so that he wouldn't be there as a thorn in the side of people who would like to just make rules on their own rules, not the Constitution's rules. And they got a good test when the Voldemort sickness happened, shutting everybody down. They saw how docile and camel-like we all are. Become a lion. You start, you can do it. You see, it's not just in your own spiritual life, but in the life outside. You can also be a lion. And it may save your democracy. It may save your future. Because if we let these people continue by being dumb and docile, they will destroy the world. And on that happy note. <laughs> well, well, on that happy note, for the ones that are watching, please click the link and go to John's website and get the yes. periodical so you know how the world's yeah. going to end. <laughs> or how the world will not end. If you uh, if you uh, become the thing, the people that I mean, you know, you look at Dennis Kucinich, you look at uh, currently the Senator um, Rand Paul, just watch how he's fighting for your rights beyond him being a Kentucky Republican. He's upsetting all the Republicans, too. You know, it's um, and you share a lot in common with the people you might deem as blue or red. I also talk a lot about that. I mean, we didn't get it into this show. It looked like we might have gone in that direction, but I think in another direction, I'm going to talk at length about the ways in which things can be reconstructed in our, I mean, just some ideas. I mean, I wrote a whole book about it. It was called uh, Alt Beyond Alt-Left, Alt-Right, A Community of Americans. I mean, the book has a red American flag draped and another and a blue American flag and a white field with a red border. A maroon border but it's it's basically i i look i hit both sides and then come to this idea and it was in 2018 when i wrote it when i i opened it by talking about how in 1998 the first time i had my landline wiretapped in my life was after i'd been on bbc radio 
and um oh, wait your landline was tapped yeah yeah it was tapped. I didn't know that. Wow. it started clicking and um wow. and for about six to nine months it was clicking because and it happened after i on bbc radio uh, I said that uh, it was the 1998 uh, midterm elections that happened. And I said, if if this polarization of Democrats and Republicans in the Congress deepens, I foresee us at the threshold of a civil war around 2020. And so I said, and then it's, well, it's three years from now. And now it's just time for me to, to take that prediction and look at a way to avoid that. You know, and so I, I talk about how the, the concept, I go into essays about the concept of a party is by its very nature, a polarizing, a polarizing concept. And I talk about how the founding fathers were the, the thing that terrified Jefferson and George Washington and Adams and, all, and Abigail Adams um, was, <laughs> was, if, was if people would form parties. Because a lot of people probably don't know because you didn't have your civics class. Probably a lot of you probably assume that the two-party system is part of, is in the constitutional law. It's not. Um, there were no parties when the United States started its republic. And they were afraid if parties ever came, it would be the end of the republic and democracy. Because special interests, and they literally spelled it out back in the 1780s they were spelling it out exactly what's happening as to us now and my book shows that and then i talk about how um because of air travel improving what was lost when democrats and republicans had to spend most you know a good portion of their time living in washington dc they lived as neighbors you know, they might fight tooth and nail on the floor of the Senate or the Congress, but then they'd all, their kids knew each other. You know, it was a, like a community. You, everybody knew each other. They'd go to barbecues and things. And they, they used to let leave that all in the Capitol building, leave that all in the White House. And they would be friends. So they created human relationships, human community connections they were not uh polarized like our people and one of the things that caused that which i write about in this book is is when it flying became so efficient that you know you spend three days in congress and then you go back to your folks in this in the state where you live and what happened was the community was lost the other side of the bench became strangers your kids didn't play with their kids. And just simple human things like that is how this thing got really messed up to the point of civil war or needing a new revolution, which could happen in the next few years. You know, it's, it's, it's a potential. Hopefully it'll be a peaceful Jeffersonian revolution. But, um, but anyway, so, so that happened. Um, then I talk about in the end is what's needed is I, if if it were up to me, I would make any party illegal. They would be banished from the political world of Americans because parties are by nature dividers, tribal. We are the blue people. We're better than those red Americans and that we fly over all the time. And the red Americans go, oh, those are the woke and the, this and that. And, the, and, and so it, it creates tribalism. It creates... The blue and the gray of the Civil War last becomes the blue and the red if we don't find a way to uh, to drop the concept of political parties and start to adopt the concept of political communities. Because a community by its very nature, like I live in a little village of a thousand people on an island in the Pacific Northwest, and we all know each other. We all, you know, we all doesn't mean you won't disagree with your neighbors but the thing about community it's different from a party a party is all or nothing my way or the highway we're gonna rush you all out of power and then we'll do what we want but if you do that in a community it's destroyed you know you will be lost of house home water food business friends all lost so if you're in a situation where the stake is you gotta, you just, it's in your DNA in a community situation that you gotta find common ground 
with somebody who's blue or red in your community or another color or something like that. Because, and you can start by doing the, just asking and communicating with people. I've been around in red, so I'm in a very deep blue part of the island here uh, with the island where I live um, in the South End. Uh, but I've often in my travels, I've gone to Texas, I've gone to uh, Arkansas, I did a convention there. And I actually had my eyes open. I would say that that the people who are in red states are more open to hearing opposing views if you're respectful. If you don't come in like holier than thou and start puritanically going, you're a red state. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, they just they'll be, they'll roll their eyes and walk away. Um, but I've found it's easier to talk to people in red states about difficult political issues than it is in my own village. <laughs> You know, they just, uh, when I wrote my Trump book, uh, my first of the three, and I mean, I thought I wouldn't have to make the third one, but it's a good chance I might have to write the third and final Trump trilogy book. And I started the book talking about how I was walking down, I mean, this new book, I'll, I'll do it more, but I, I used to walk, after, they all know that I'm, you know, protect and do this stuff in my town. And they're all saying, well, John, what's going to happen? You know, Trump won, what's what? And... And then when I told them, well, you, you, because of Trump's nature, because of his, his very unique character, I mean, his astrology is quite, he's deep. He's actually a very complicated guy. Um, and he has this ability to, and I didn't vote for him. <laughs> you know, it, it, he has this ability in his astrology um, that if you throw negativity at him, he's a mirror it bounces re immediately right back on it. And you had such obvious signs of it. Look how he went through Jeb Bush. Oh, you you're don't have any energy because he's got this innocent, precocious eight-year-old inside of him. Oh, you're fake news. Um, all true. I work for CNN. I <laughs> break as a guess. <laughs> and I also debated Sean Hannity and made him go, you know, sometimes on Fox, you know, so until they banned me because of my prediction about the towers falling that I made six years earlier. And their response was rather than to bring all the people together in that show and figure out what we got right and what we got wrong and then see what's coming next. Their, their reaction, Mr. Ailes at reaction was tell that hoagie's blacklisted. So I, I, and I, they didn't tell me. So I didn't know for two years until I finally found out, but uh, that they were, why they weren't calling me. Anymore. Um, so the, if if you can you will find if you can just understand and respect the need of people have different views and 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 that's what makes our country interesting and it's always been a vibrant debating country and sometimes we've even gone to civil war over things that we couldn't agree upon but there's really so much that we share in common with the other side that um, if you, you, so you start with the low hanging fruit, you start with things like, yeah, we all, we need, we need a sewer system. Yeah. You know, we got to find a way to make it fiscally responsible and not some big boondoggle making our, don't throw money at it. Like, like some one side likes to do and don't be so cheap that it can't, we got, we, we got to find a way to get the sewer system done. You know, you know, we got to, you know, law and order is an important thing. Look what happens in cities that have defunded their police. They're becoming places where gangs are going in. Seattle's like this. Old business areas are leaving downtown. If you watch X, you'll see it. You'll see the daily stuff of it. Um, you'll see all these people coming in like an army and they ransack it like the Goths and run off with whatever things they can grab and no one stops them. That's a recipe for the breakdown of your American civilization. And so, you know, I talk to policemen. I don't, I'm not afraid of them. I used to be in security, so I understand both sides. So common ground, you find common as much common ground with your neighbors as you can. And when you can't, you still remain loving and respectful. He, and, and you don't preach. You live by example. 
that's that's why the whole world is turning away from our country right now because now they have an option they don't use the u.s dollar as a reserve currency anymore that's going away when the u.s could keep everybody under hostage that way they could walk into any country and say no don't do as i do do as i say and and the whole world's been under this for a long time and now they're free of it and you this is one of the least things the most important thing you ought to know is that your dollar is no longer controlling the world and it and so that's leaving in a few years so and the reason is that uh you have not lived by example. You're, the neocons in their first manifesto after the Cold War terrified them, and they had to find a new war, war business model, a new Cold War. They started right after 1992 when the Soviet Union collapsed. And you know, Dick Cheney and, and Paul Wolfowitz uh, wrote these, I've, and I write about these uh, things in a lot of my books, these manifestos. And they said, oh, you know, you'll hear people say like, John Adams that you know you shouldn't go out fighting monsters and you should not like force yourself on others but they go why not so and you know they were arguing the idea that um you don't you don't live by example they literally were saying ah, no we don't have to live we just make everybody do what we say and and we don't live by example you, you're not going to be the city shining on the hill anymore that people want to go to. You're not going to want to see the Statue of Liberty when you're coming through. We're going to tell you the way the world is. And if you're if you're our uh, enemy, you're in trouble. And as, and as uh, Kissinger said, and if you're our friend, you're dead. <laughs> you know, so these are the kind of monsters that, that we by not well by us being so busy with our own lives understandably we got our lives to live but these people know that and that's our weakness and they pulled out all the civics classes so you wouldn't know your rights and that and so we you know if one way to cure a situation is you got to own up to your part in it you can't just blame it on the other because that's disempowering you know how did now they may have all kinds of problems that make them uh, bad and stuff like that but if you're in an interaction with them and it's toxic toxic what are you bringing into it if you if you don't go there you will not empower yourself to find solutions oh it's his fault and i can't do anything about him but try to vote him out that's disempowerment talking and they play you the both sides of this two-faced storefront called the corporate deep state party it's donkey crats and it's dumbo publicans. It's just a the, they're just a storefronts to con you in, neo con you in, basically. <laughs> you got us. You got to own up to it. It's okay. We make mistakes. That's the only way we grow. And but if you deny your mistakes and blame it on the other, you deserve exactly the future you will get. Well, we'll leave it at that, John. I tried to do a upper note, but but it's not it's not an upper note. It's the it's the truth, and sometimes the truth yeah. has to happen. I contend it's the truth. You may not. That's okay. But at least people say that don't. A lot of people who read me say, "Well, I often find it uncomfortable to read his stuff, but I like that he makes me think and feel." So. I hope I can do that for more of you and and you interact with me and then that will help me communicate better as well. Right. So just another reminder of the ones that are watching, please click the link that will take you to the website for John and you can order his periodical and set up a reading. Uh, that's a one-on-one -on -one and he'll, you know, go into details with your astrology and, uh, to do what was it called the the cards what was the cards tarot. Uh, the, the tarot, tarot cards yes okay. i use the osho zen tarot deck and it's a very popular deck and i knew i know my deva padma who created it and uh and uh it was inspired by my master so it's a it's an amazing deck <laughs> lots yeah. of fun yeah so i i have done it i've yep. known people that have done this so he survived. Uh, i wreck I survived it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and uh, so I do recommend it. So please click the link. It'll take you to his website. 
and uh, please buy his, his periodical. So John, thank you for coming onto the channel and- uh, Thank you. you yeah. I love you yeah. all. They all love you too, John. Even the ones that hate me. <laughs> that, well, in fact, you know, the, no, the no, thing love, is I mean, the people, <laughs> I, I'll finish with this story. I did it before, but it's a Sufi story. It's a really great Muslim Sufi story. You know, the, the, the guy was, um, Sufi had a, a, his disciple had a father who was really, didn't like his master, but the master said, I've just finished a new book of thoughts on the Quran and all that. Will you give it to your father and tell me what happens? And so he goes dutifully to the father and hands him the book. And the father goes, what is that, that trash? You're not going to put it in there. I hate him. And he went to the street and threw it in the, in the piss and shit in the street. You know? And, and get away. And so he walked back. And what the mother, the mother still held, hold the father. and said, father, father, come, calm down. You've got to be more humane. You know, people have their opinions and, and you shouldn't try to suppress and be violent about that and and so he went back and so the pastor said so what happened um well you were right my father got really angry and he threw it in the in the shitty street and and uh, but my but my mother she really came she came and she was trying to convince him not to be that way and be more civil master looked, hmm. there's nothing i can do for your mother she there's just nothing but your father, he's so angry that he, the anger turns to love. Look what happened to Paul on the road to Damascus. You know, he was, he was out to kill Christians. He had been killing them for the Roman government. And then he was so hateful of them. Hate can turn into love. Yeah, it's always dangerous when people really get hateful I said look out look out you're just you, any moment the littlest thing might turn you into a love bunny <laughs> you know and uh yeah. so it's so bad. there's a weird psychology about it the thing you hate you are uh, it's something you, you haven't reconciled in yourself and then if if triggers if it's a stroke on the road to damascus not a stroke a heat stroke on the road to damascus mm -hmm. um well that was a trigger and he completely turned him around so the father he said he could possibly be my disciple your mother it's too late she's too wishy-washy <laughs> okay so what we're going to do is you have to do your bye-bye with the audience bye -bye. okay all right. or, or as, or as uh, vikia in the in the luna of the pantera says bye-bye in russia in russian is Poca poca. Right. Poca poca. All right. <laughs> so let me stop the recording here.